first, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, 2020 Merck Animal Health Mississippi State University Southeast Stalker Conference. Uh, this is the third evening uh, of four, so we'll have tonight and we'll have tomorrow night. Uh, in the way of housekeeping, most of most of the uh, folks on the on the on the videos have uh, been 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 on uh, in previous nights, but just in the way of housekeeping to remind us, um, everybody is muted. Um, you, uh, it's best if you remain muted. Uh, keep your mute on, and um, unless you have a question during the question and answer, and then feel free to unmute and ask a question. At any time, at any time during any of the presentations, you can ask a question in the chat box. You can type a question in the chat box and ask a question. Um, I, I see we have a question there already, Harold, um, and I'll we'll have to look and see what uh, what what that is about. Um, maybe you can look as I'm talking. Um, you can ask questions anytime in the chat box. Uh, those will be uh, collected, and Harold will uh, kind of quarterback that during the Q and A. Uh, it's, not, it's not showing up on my end. It's best if you uh, turn off your video feed. Uh, that is, uh, push the stop video button. It will save you some uh, bandwidth. The times in the schedule that are given are approximate. Um, we will move from one presentation to the Q&A to the next presentation without break. Uh, we will and not later than eight, we are obligated to do that. But apart from that, we will move through the presentations at whatever pace we can. All the presentations have been pre-recorded. Uh, and so we will run the presentation and then we will host a Q&A with the presenter at the end of the presentation. If we have a glitch, if somehow or another I get knocked offline or my computer goes down, please just hold on. I'll get it fixed and I'll be back. Um, so uh, just kind of hold on and uh, give me a, a few minutes and see if I can get it fixed. Um, just a reminder that um, the presentations here do have, um, there is a continuing education credit available uh, for the presentations here. Um, there is an online test, which will, the link for that will be sent to you at the end of this, of these presentations by email. So you will receive an email before these presentations are over, but close to the end, uh, allowing you to open that email and go to a link, which will take you to a, the test at Kansas State. The test will be about 20 questions in length and we'll cover the entire night's presentation. So we will have all the presentations for this evening will be covered on that test. You pass that test, you get four, four CE credit hours. You can take the test repeatedly. Uh, Dr. Newcomb will do a test review at the end of the night, and that review will be very helpful in passing the test. So I suggest that we all stick in there and, and be sure to catch Harold's review. So watch the evening presentation, watch Harold's review, and check your email for the link to the test, then go take the test. The test will be available for, until December the 28th, and Kansas will send Kansas State will send you the CE certificates that you earn through the email sometime after the first of the year. Harold, did I forget anything? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'd like to just welcome everybody back again on on behalf of Merck. Um, I hope you have another good night and. So are you ready to start? Um, uh, just give me just a minute and we will here. Uh, All right, while you're doing that, I'll introduce Dr. Chad Malant. He is a native of Louisiana and he's a graduate of LSU. So he's a Bayou Bengal. He, he got his master's, uh, he got his DVM from LSU in 2012. And then he got his master's in avian medicine from the University of Georgia, and he's a diplomat at the College of Veterinary uh, Poultry Medicine. He's got over 12 years of experience in the um, poultry industry, and when he came to us, he was fresh out of what we're what he's going to talk about tonight, tonight, which was implementing no antibiotics ever in poultry production. 
And I think as you see, as this goes on, that we're, we're talking a lot about antibiotics and, and new technologies, but that's kind of what we wanted to talk about throughout the meeting. And we want to see how other industries have handled some antibiotic issues. So with that, go ahead, Dr. Eppers. Okay, thank you, Harold. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Chad Malinek. I'm a member of the Merck Poultry Tech Service team. I've been in the poultry industry for over 12 years, and before joining Merck, I practiced as a production veterinarian for the second and eighth largest broiler companies in the U.S., in which I had over 4 million birds a week being processed as no antibiotics ever. So today I'm going to talk to you about the challenges of implementing no antibiotics ever in poultry production. So what brings me here today to talk to you about poultry production, specifically no antibiotics ever? I started my career as a production veterinarian with the second largest poultry company, then moved to the eighth largest poultry company in the United States. At the second largest, over 13 million broilers a week were processed under my veterinary supervision, four million of which were no antibiotics ever. Then at the eighth largest company, three and a half antibiotics important to human medicine according to the World Health Organization. Then in May of 2019, I joined the Merck Animal Health Poultry Technical Services team. Through this presentation, we will cover the following topics. Understanding labels. Why did the poultry industry go no antibiotics ever? The biggest health challenges associated with no antibiotics ever. My field experiences and the top 12 focus areas to be successful with no antibiotics ever. The first challenge is understanding what all the acronyms mean when talking about USDA labeling, and it's like acronym soup. First, ABF or antibiotic free. There is no USDA label for ABF. It's just a marketing term. All US chicken meat is technically antibiotic free in the sense that no harmful antibiotic residues are present in the meat at harvesting due to withdrawal periods and other precautions required by the government. All label claims are approved by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service Process Verified Program. There are over 66 pages of approved poultry listings on the USDA PVP website. The first approved label is no antibiotics ever or raised without antibiotics, which are synonymous. These birds are raised without the use of antibiotics for prevention, control, or treatment of disease. Ionophores may not be used in NAE in the United States. Ionophores equal polyether ionophore antibiotics, even though their major mode of action is protozoal control. Sick birds should be treated with antibiotics if necessary, but will not be sold as NAE or RWA. The second label is no antibiotics important to human medicine. Those antibiotics can be according to the FDA or World Health Organization lists. The only major difference is that BMD is not human medically important to the FDA, but is to the World Health Organizations. Ionophores can be used in these birds. The third label is certified responsible antibiotic use. Antibiotics with human analogs are not allowed for disease prevention, growth promotion, feed efficiency, or weight gain. Antibiotics with human analogs can only be used therapeutically to treat disease in poultry diagnosed with bacterial disease, control disease in poultry exposed to infectious bacteria. You can use ionophores in these birds, and the U.S. Department of Agricultural School Food and Lunch Program is the main buyer. So why did the poultry industry go no antibiotics ever? It is multifactorial, but the three main reasons are government regulations, consumer pressures, and then the customers, such as the retail and quick service restaurants, needing to meet those consumer demands. Government regulations played a role in some of the decision on the removal of antibiotics. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration feared antibiotic overuse in animals, which may reduce effectiveness in humans. The FDA called antimicrobial resistance a mounting public health problem of global significance. They proposed important changes to antibiotic use in animals. The FDA issued three documents proposing to modify use of antibiotics in food producing animals. The guidance for industry 209, 213, and 152. 
Human medically important antibiotics can only be used for the prevention, control, treatment, must follow the label, and no growth promotion use is allowed, which resulted in significant reduction in antibiotic use in poultry feed as well as hatcheries. Shoppers expressed concerns over antibiotic resistance. In a consumer report survey, 72% of respondents were extremely or very concerned about the overuse of antibiotics in animal feed, including the potential to create superbugs. 60% of respondents said they would pay at least five cents a pound more for meat raised without antibiotics. 37% would pay a dollar or more extra per pound. In a recent survey published in Supermarket News in September of 2020, Claims-based meat grew 32% amid the COVID-19 crisis. The poultry company's customers, such as retailers, are focused to meet shopper needs. Most grocery store chains sell both NAE and conventional products, allowing shoppers to have freedom of choice. Stores sell NAE products at a higher price, which correlate with the Consumer Report survey in the previous slide. The chicken on the left is conventional and the chicken on the right is NAE. There is a $1.50 a pound difference in cost. This has presented opportunities for producers in which they may be able to negotiate a premium price for NAE products, which they can turn pass along production costs to the grocery store chains. Some quick service restaurants are shifting globally to some form of NAE or antibiotic restriction program due to the following. Non-governmental organizational pressure such as Pew Charitable Trust or Natural Resource Defense Council. The potential to gain new patrons with marketing campaigns that appeal to those that look for claims based products. And some quick service restaurants had increased concerns over antibiotic resistance. This shows a 2019 update on the antibiotic commitments for chicken. 17 of the top 25 chains have fully or partially met antibiotic commitments, according to the Centers for Food Safety. So where does the poultry industry currently stand? Almost 60% of U.S. broiler production is no antibiotics ever. In this graph, you'll see how it's changed over time from 2015 to 2019. Red being full spectrum, it can use any form of antibiotic. Orange being reduced use. Blue being ionophores only. And then last but not least is no antibiotics ever. As you can see, the ionophore only or World Health no antibiotics important human medicine went from 35% to 15% over a four year span. And no antibiotics went from 13% to 58% in a four year span. So my goal as a production veterinarian was to keep birds healthy, ensure animal welfare, and hopefully process 100% of the birds as no antibiotics ever. The two biggest health challenges encountered during NAE production are number one, necrotic enteritis, and number two, enteritis or dysbacteriosis, which is the failure to maintain a stable gut microflora. So what factors contribute to necrotic enteritis? I know this is a very busy diagram that shows it can be a number of things, but this is a more simplified way of looking at those things. It can be linked to feed ingredients or the presentation of feed, cool brooding temps or cool house temps too early in the bird's life, poor poultry house management, feed outages, or intestinal damage, whether it's due to coxie, worms, or overheating. So another way of looking at it is the pathway of the disease process, which starts with intestinal damage by coccidial infection, creating an um, intestinal T cell response, which releases cytokines, and the cytokines activate mucin genes of the goblet cell and produce excess mucus which in turn allows clostridium perfringens production and mucolytic enzymes and causes an increased growth in about eight to 10 minutes, which produces an alpha toxin. And that ultimately leads to the necrotic enteritis cycle. I like to think about necrotic enteritis using this simple diagram. For me, it's about overeating or poor digestion. And what do I mean by this? Overeating is typically seen when growers are pushing birds too hard too early or 
when birds get too cool too early and the only thing they can do to warm themselves is to eat more feed and hence leads to poor digestion. That increased nutrient flow to the hind gut leads to increased clostridial growth. The growth of that sequel clostridium then translocates back to the ileum due to birds retroperistalsis. And if there's any damage in that mid gut, then it has the potential to form necrotic enteritis. So the next two slides are some of my field experiences with no antibiotics ever production, and it's specifically more geared towards necrotic enteritis. Necrotic enteritis is often more severe in the winter months and typically seen on poor husbandry farms and can be seen in the top 25% growers, which are your best growers, which are usually due to heavy weight gaining farms. This is due to birds getting too cool too early in life, which causes them to overeat and allow more nutrient flow to the hind gut, which allows increased clostridial growth and in turn causing necrotic enteritis. Feed passage up to 15% is normal and usually starts in the second feed due to dysbacteriosis. Sticky droppings and burnt foot pads increase due to extra moisture associated with feed passage and dysbacteriosis. There's a higher incidence if ventilation or litter management is poor. Now let's shift gears and talk about the top 12 focus areas to be successful with no antibiotics ever production. First and foremost is communication. Second is biosecurity. Third is breeders and the eggs. Fourth is hatchery sanitation and chick quality. Fifth is water sanitation. Sixth is bacterial control, whether it's the feed or the water. Seventh is immune health. Eighth is coccidial control or immunity. Ninth is husbandry aspects. Tenth is nutritional aspects. Eleventh is monitoring and communication and being ready to respond. And last but not least, number 12 is downtime and density. First, everyone must be on the same page and that starts with communication and teamwork. Day in and day out, everyone must be willing to communicate all aspects that are involved in no antibiotics ever production. Secondly, biosecurity must be a priority, and it's not just about keeping out avian influenza. It is comprised of both external and internal biosecurity. External involves putting up barriers to keep things out. Internal is making sure the environment is controlled within facilities, such as keeping things from moving from house to house on the same farm. Both types are utilized in all poultry production facilities. All in all out production is the best defense against pathogens which means all birds come on the farm at the same time and leave the farm at the same time. Third is the focus on breeders and their eggs that are gonna be sent into the hatcher to become broiler chicks. Eggs are a very critical part of this process. We must avoid setting floor eggs if at all possible, which come in contact with bacteria and feces. Next, we must keep nest and pads and eggs belts clean as possible because they will touch every egg that goes into the hatchery. We can also recommend using automatic nest closures, which help keep hens out of the nest at night when they're not producing eggs. Eggs coming to the hatchery should be clean, dry, and not altered. These images here depict egg that got wet, an egg that had been sanded, and an egg that had bacterial contamination or feces stuck to it. This is an experimental design that actually showed the same principle of why we should not alter eggshell surface. This is a negative control normal egg. This is a normal egg that had nothing done to the egg shell that was dipped in a bacterial solution. And this is an egg that had the outside of the egg sanded and that was dipped in the same bacterial solution. As you can see, a lot more is able to get through those pores uh, when the cuticle has been disrupted. We also need to make sure eggs are handled properly and storage is done right to prevent sweating because sweating can allow bacteria to be drawn through the egg shell as well. And last but not least, we should never wash eggs because those egg pores will allow bacteria to be drawn in through it. And a way to tell if they've been washed is to look at the bottom surface of an egg. The chart depicts some of the eggs that may cause problems that should be discarded. We must also pay close attention to shell quality. Fourth is the focus on hatchery sanitation and chick quality. The hatcheries must be clean. Worrying about chicks per man hour is not going to help. Extra scrutiny on hatchery sanitation practices are required. It takes a lot more elbow grease to get the hatchery ready to go no antibiotics ever. We must have a robust monitoring program for bacteria and funguses, 
which should be done regularly. Some operations still use formaldehyde or peroxide systems in the hatchers to reduce the bacterial load. Vaccine preparation must take place in a clean environment, especially in OVO, where a hole is punched in the egg for the chick to receive its vaccine. The hatching window or time frame for all chicks to come out of their eggs must be narrow so that all chicks hatch in the same time window. So we send out chicks that have not been stressed by overheating or overcooling. Chick overheating negatively impacts the intestinal tract and common signs of early stress from hatch through the first 24 hours of life are pasted vents. If chicks become overheated early in life, they may be more susceptible to necrotic enteritis due to the insult of the intestines or weaker immune system due to inadequate yolk absorption of maternal antibodies. The bottom line is if you don't have a quality chick, no antibiotics ever production will be difficult. Breeder egg and hatchery cleanliness all impact the health and the quality of the chick. Optimization of livability, weight gain, and conversion will be impacted by chick quality. So why are breeders, egg pack, hatchery sanitation, and chick quality very critical to no antibiotics ever production? When you're doing NAE, you must remove antibiotics in over or a day of age, which we had done for years within the industry. So as you can see, if we set dirty eggs or have bad chick quality, such as unhealed navels, it leads to bacterial infection. If everything is good without antibiotics, we're happy to have 0.75 to 1.25% first week mortality. If less than ideal, we'd be happy with a 1.5% average first week mortality. The fifth area of focus is water sanitation. Drinking systems need regular cleaning, otherwise they will become dirty and provide a source of bacterial growth. Contaminated drinking water is often not visible to the eye, but chickens become sick and performance levels decline especially with young chicks when temperatures are high and water flow is low, there's a greater risk of bacterial growth. Water quality should be assessed regularly by laboratory analysis for things such as pH, chlorine levels, minerals, coliforms. Water sanitation is essential to new antibiotic sever programs for the removal of biofilms that can cause health challenges flock after flock. The sixth area is bacterial controller balance, which is key since we have removed antibiotics and we're trying to achieve good intestinal balance between the good and bad bacteria, hopefully to crowd out the bad. And we'll do this through in-feed products such as probiotics, which are direct fed microbials that act as competitive exclusions and also moss products that can bind bacteria. The next group are phytogenic feed additives, which are mainly plant-based additives used as alternative to antibiotics. Research has shown some antibacterial, anticoccidial, and anti-inflammatory properties. Phytogenic feed additives can be derived from herbs, spices, plants, and extracts, such as essential oils. And last but not least are the acids, such as short-chain fatty acids. Butyric or tributyrates actually help protect the gut. Now, if you look at the image on the right, those are all the factors that can potentially impact the hen's microbiota. And hens can pass along good or bad bacteria through the egg. The microbiota composition may be influenced by maternal antibodies supplied through the yolk. Microorganisms can be acquired in the pre-hatching phase directly from the mother in the oviduct of the hen or from the environment through the pores in the eggshell. And that's why we do not set floor eggs. In order to align the breeders and their broiler progeny, I believe in feeding them both the same probiotics so that their intestinal flora will hopefully be the same. The second avenue of bacterial control or balance is through the drinking water. And this can be done through prebiotics, which can seed the chick's gut with beneficial bacteria, or by adding blends of buffered acids, which can help control bad bacteria or support beneficial bacteria, such as formic and propionic acid, which are effective at controlling E. coli or salmonellas, or lactic or butyric acid, which are important in promoting beneficial lactobacilli in the gut microflora. And last but not least is water-soluble copper, which has been shown to control bacteria. The seventh area of focus is immune health. Birds need their immune systems to be strong since the antibiotic band-aid is gone. If the immune system is not strong, then birds may not respond properly to vaccines or thrive. Some of the common causes of immunosuppression 
are Merrick's disease, infectious bursal disease, chickenemia virus, rheoviruses, mycotoxins, and last but not least, stress. A main component of immune health is vaccination. A strong breeder vaccination program is needed to pass along good maternal antibodies into the yolk to provide two to three weeks of protection to their offspring. This is an example of a program I would have used in my breeder broilers when I was in production. My main goal was to try and achieve early immunity to provide protection to the broiler breeders themselves, and then later on using killed vaccines to provide long-lived immunity to the broiler breeders as well as to pass along maternal antibodies. Secondly, you also need a strong broiler vaccination program, and this may be given in ovo or at day of age. And this is a typical combination of vaccines that would be given to broilers to provide protection. All vaccines should be given at a full dose and applied evenly, whether that's an ovo vaccination, which is depicted on the left, which is done at 17 and a half to 19 days of age in embryos, or at day of age in the middle where birds are sprayed typically with live vaccines. And then last but not least, are the killed products that are typically given to broiler breeders later on in life to provide long life immunity. So now I'll play you a video to show you a little bit more about coccidiosis specific to poultry and their life cycle, as well as some control options. Bird performance in commercial poultry production is often significantly impacted by intestinal parasites of the Imeria family. These cause coccidiosis, a very common disease in poultry, leading to avoidable financial losses for producers. The infection starts with the chicken ingesting sporulated Imeria oocysts. This ubiquitous parasite can be found in feed, in water, and in the litter. In fact, everywhere in the poultry house, as well as in the surrounding environment. The main part of the parasite's life cycle takes place in the intestinal tract of the infected bird over a period of four to seven days. A sporulated oocyst contains four sporocysts. Mechanical action in the gizzard of the bird releases the sporocysts. Later, in the duodenum, enzymatic action releases two sporozoites from every sporocyst. The mobile sporozoites then invade the epithelial cells of the intestinal wall. Once inside the cell, the sporozoite undergoes various changes. In the end, the epithelial cell bursts, and hundreds of newly formed merozoites reach the intestinal lumen. These now invade neighboring epithelial cells, and the whole process of asexual multiplication is repeated two to four times. The Imeria life cycle is then concluded with a sexual reproduction stage, beginning with the formation of male microgametes and female macrogametes. The final stage of the parasite's life cycle produces large numbers of new Imeria oocysts that are discharged with the feces into the external environment. In the warm, moist litter of the chicken house, the oocyst can mature and sporulate, a crucial stage in the parasitic cycle. Sporulation makes the Imeria oocysts infective. They can then be ingested by other birds of the same or the next flock. Sporulated oocysts of the Imeria family cause coccidiosis, associated with damage to the intestinal epithelial cells. Imeria acervulina damages the tips of the villi. It occurs in high numbers in the upper intestine, where the nutrients are broken up. Imeria maxima occurs in the middle intestine, critical to nutrient absorption, and causes deeper reaching damage to the villi. This can result in significant impact on weight and feed conversion. In the cica of the affected bird, Imeria tenella causes massive cell damage and hemorrhage that can result in death. Through repeated exposure to the Imeria species reproducing inside the birds, immunity to coccidiosis develops in the flock. 
some species reproduce in high numbers and therefore induce immunity quickly. Others with a lower reproductive rate can take longer. Immunity to one species does not cross protect against the others. Most birds show no obvious outward symptoms of coccidiosis after infection and have low lesion scores. Nevertheless, their average daily weight gain can suffer considerably. The exact extent of this adverse effect is determined by the timing of the infection with the Imeria oocysts. During the first three weeks of a broiler's life, the immune system, the skeletal structure, and the intestinal system develop. The growth of muscle mass happens mainly in the final weeks. So an early infection occurs during a slower growth period when the impact on weight loss is small. This may allow the bird time to recover and to easily compensate for the minor transitory reduction in weight. An infection with Imeria oocysts late in the bird's life, however, has a more dramatic impact on weight gain. Late infection during the period of highest daily weight gain leaves no time for the bird to recover. feed medication with anticoccidials that suppress the life cycle of the Imeria parasites represents a convenient, well-established treatment method for coccidiosis. Broilers are routinely given anticoccidials until just before slaughter. However, normal ionophore programs allow some of the parasites to escape suppression and to reproduce. As a consequence, delayed oocyst shedding and very mild lesions still occur. Continuous use of ionophores result in reduced efficacy, leading to even more oocyst shedding and more significant lesions during the most vulnerable period of broiler performance. And even with poultry houses disinfected thoroughly at slaughter, delayed shedding causes high numbers of oocysts to remain, ready to infect the next incoming flock, the carryover effect. This high oocyst burden leads to the development of resistant Imeria strains. Due to carryover, these strains become dominant in the poultry house over time. Flock uniformity is negatively affected because the chemical anticoccidials lose almost all their efficacy and the ionophores show significantly reduced performance. As a result, weight gain suffers considerably. A new drug may improve control temporarily, but as medications age, they begin each rotation with their efficacy already compromised by the development of resistance. Coccidiosis challenge continues to build up in the house and flock performance becomes erratic. To avoid this scenario, vaccination with Coxivac vaccines offers a promising alternative strategy involving the introduction of sensitive Imeria strains, controlled immunity, at an earlier time of infection. While the first vaccinated flock will still be exposed to carryover, the oocyst burden, especially in resistant strains, decreases with each successive flock. Bird growth becomes more homogeneous, and once the birds are shedding fewer oocysts, the ammonia in the litter helps to reduce the overall coxy challenge in the house further. Vaccination shifts the coxie exposure window to the left and reduces the exposure level. Uniformity of the flock and of performance improves. 
the Imeria strain still populating the broiler house come from birds vaccinated with Coxivac and are now sensitive to anti-coccidials. So I hope that gave you a little more glimpse into the Imeria life cycle and poultry coccidiosis in general, as well as a little bit more about control, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit further in the next few slides. The eighth focus area is coccidiosis control or immunity, which can be achieved in three ways. First is coccidiosis vaccines. 43% of all broilers received a coccidiosis vaccine in 2019, which is roughly 4 billion birds. Secondly is chemicals, such as Ampril, Clinicox, Coiden, Daycox, Nicarbazine, Robenz, or Zoomix. And last but not least are the phytogenic feed additives, such as the yuccas, saponins, essential oils, and research has shown some anticoccidial properties to these. So when we look at anticoccidial programs, we need to decide if we're getting immunity or not. With coccidiosis vaccines, we are gaining immunity. With chemicals, we will not gain an immunity, which may not be sustainable long term. The next few slides will cover the ninth focus area of husbandry, first being temperature. The first three weeks of life are most critical for chicks. A chick is unable to maintain its own body temperature. Remember, we have removed the mother hen and she was the chick's brooder in nature. Now we have mechanical brooders and there is no way it can do a better job than the mother hen. The baby chick is unable to regulate its own body temperature for the first few days of life. Thus, we supply them with supplemental heat, the brooders. These chicks must rely on the environment for heat so we must preheat the floor between 86 and 90 degrees. In turn, warm dry floors equal warm feet and comfortable chicks. We need to do our best to minimize stress. Air and floor temps should encourage bird activity and not impair feed and water consumption. Comfortable chicks start eating and drinking quicker. We must watch bird behavior. They will give us the signs if they are not comfortable. They will huddle when they're too cold or they'll pant if they're too hot. And we can use rectal temps, controllers, or temp charts as a guide. The quicker birds get on feed, the faster the GI tract develops, which leads to better gut health. We target greater than 95% crop fills by 24 hours post-placement into the houses as depicted on the right. Now we'll talk about lighting. Bright lights in the brood area are important to get chicks off to a good start. A minimum of three foot candles, but ideally greater than four foot candles, maintains good bird activity and attracts birds to feed. Lighting program changes can be reduced at day seven of age. Major light dark interval changes should not be made within the necrotic enteritis window, which is typically between 10 and 21 days of age. Certain welfare programs may clash with lighting programs, feeding programs, and managing coxie. Now we're on to feed management. Remember, the quicker the birds eat, the faster the GI tract develops. We use supplemental feeder trays or lids as those pictured on the right and keep them in front of the chicks for at least seven to nine days. Then we move those lids to the off end of the house during transitions. Supplemental feed should be removed gradually to avoid spikes in mortality or litter eating. We keep birds from pecking or eating litter excessively by keeping enough feed in front of them. Litter eating allows extra oocyst or bacteria to enter the gut. And we must never ever run out of feed for any reason. Birds too cool from 10 to 21 days of age have a greater chance of necrotic enteritis. Remember, the increased undigested feed to the hind gut is the only option for birds to warm themselves. A remedy to this is that two to three weeks of age, we warm the houses two to three degrees above normal without heat stressing or overheating the birds by paying attention to them. This is in hope to balance the feed intake with the bird's digestive capability. We also pay attention during the transition from the starter to grower feeds, especially looking at the crumble to a pellet, as well as the hardness or pellet durability. Now we turn to water management. We need to do our best to use good drinker management. And that's done through properly cleaning water lines before flock placement, making sure lines are leveled and at the proper height for the bird's age and have the proper pressure and proper flow for the bird's age. We must also walk the birds early and get them up and moving. You cannot walk birds too much the first 10 days to increase their activity. 
With water management, we must also do our best to control excess litter moisture, as you see on the right, which can promote cycling of coccidia and overgrowth of bacteria that leads to other disease issues. It can also chill birds, cause immunosuppression, can cause high ammonia levels greater than 50 parts per million, which can lead to foot pad burns, breast blisters, damage to the respiratory system, and last but not least, corneal ulcerations. Now let's focus on bedding management. We should only use dry absorbent bedding material and place it at a depth of four to six inches within the house. And we need to keep that litter dry and litter moisture should be between 25 to 35% and the pan on the right. We should use proper water management and proper ventilation to maintain those dry conditions. Another valuable tool of bedding management is windrowing which kills some bacteria, viruses, and coccidiosis. We need at least 14 days without birds between flocks to get this done right. You don't even have to use a textbook method to get it done, but we need to at least put it into two rows. No turning is necessary, but we need to have internal temperatures achieve greater than 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The next few slides will focus on the 10th item, nutrition, which is important to NAE success Nutritionists, veterinarians, and live production managers must always communicate about what's going on in the field and what they are seeing. Higher indigestible protein early may cause a higher risk of necrotic enteritis. We want to use enzymes based off of feed ingredients, such as ones that attack corn, wheat, or other diet substrates that are being used. Cheap feed does not equal good feed conversion, nor does it equal successful no antibiotics ever production. So what are some of the major feed ingredients in no antibiotics ever programs? Many of them are all vegetable diets, and this was done to avoid meat meal contaminated with clostridium. However, it has evolved into marketing claims, but sometimes vegetable proteins are not as digestible for poultry as animal-based protein sources, which may potentially lead to wet litter and burnt paws. Some of the base ingredients that are typically used are corn and soybean meal, Fat sources may be corn oil, soybean oil, or acidulated oils. And then some optional alternative ingredients are wheat, milo, DDGs, and then a variety of meals such as canola meal, corn meal, peanut meal, or corn gluten meal. Lower calcium is a key nutritional factor in no antibiotic sever production. Dietary calcium, phosphorus, and phytase can play a role in the natural necrotic enteritis cycle. Special attention should be paid to the calcium source, type, size, and level of inclusion within the diet, especially within the starter feeds. Research from Dr. Audrey McElroy at Texas A&M University suggests that lower dietary calcium level may reduce necrotic enteritis associated mortality. I have personally done this firsthand with my nutritionist and we have seen success in reducing necrotic enteritis associated mortality as long as the nutritional factors for bone development are being managed accordingly. As you can see here, a 0.6 inclusion versus a 0.9 inclusion led to a 10% reduction in necrotic enteritis associated mortality. One of the major challenges of going no antibiotics ever in poultry production is utilizing products to fill the void where antibiotics used to be. It's gonna take a combination of feed additives you need to be willing to experiment with those additives. And it usually takes a combination of products, whether it's enzymes, probiotics, copper, acids, and anticoccidials. Here's an example on the right of one of the programs that I had utilized and all the different products it took to try and replace or maintain the level of production we were seeing before going no antibiotics ever. Now we're moving on to the 11th topic of monitoring, communication, and being ready to respond. The reoccurring theme of the first three weeks being most critical is seen here again. Any increases in mortality or changes in bird behavior must be noted. We need to make sure that they're cutting open birds during this time frame. It ensures any possible outbreaks of coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis are caught early so that proper interventions can be employed. Early intervention is key to keeping mortality rates low and help prevent the use of antibiotics. So let's focus on be ready to respond. Now the term patching is treating with something other than antibiotic. This was paramount 
early on in knowing about Xever production to avoid a challenge of being confused, did we have birds that were treated with antibiotics? So we utilized the term patching when we treated the birds with something other than an antibiotic and were allowed to keep them in the program. We always paid attention to daily mortality to really know what was going on. And we were ready to run something quickly in order to keep them in the program. Successful necrotic enteritis inventions we had utilized were copper sulfate, many water acidifiers, essential oil products, phytogenic products, as well as low level amproleum if the mortality was driven by coccidiosis. Now let's talk about the final topic of downtime and density. Downtime is equal to the time without birds in the house, but when does it start? Is it when the birds are loaded on the truck to go to the processing plant? Or is that after every bird has left the house and the cleaning process has started? For me as a veterinarian, I like to think it's after the cleaning process has started. Ideal with no antibiotics ever production is greater than 18 days. If it's less than 14 days, problems start to rise. Viral and bacterial numbers decline rapidly after 14 days in the absence of the host. Now let's talk about bird density. Generally, a density reduction of 4% is adequate. However, a reduction of 7% should be considered if downtime has been less than 14 days. With higher density, you potentially have high moisture and more sporulation or bacterial growth, potentially more rapid exposure of flocks to oocysts, less feeder space and less feed availability. With lower density flocks, you have lower sporulation of coxie, lower exposure to coxie, potentially lower bacterial loads and more feeder space and feed availability. Density reduction can improve no antibiotics ever production. In summary, there are a lot of challenges in implementing no antibiotics ever in poultry production. I hope I was able to help you understand the USDA labels, know why the poultry industry went NAE, recognize the two biggest health challenges of no antibiotics ever production, had a small glimpse of my field experiences, and appreciated the top 12 focus areas to be successful with no antibiotics ever production. I just wanna say thank you for your time and your attention and being willing to listen to a poultry production veterinarian and learning a little bit more about what it takes to do no antibiotics ever production in poultry. I um, hope I can answer any questions you may have and uh, that you just enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Well, uh, uh, it was a great presentation. Do, do, do we have any questions yet from the audience for, for, for Dr. Chad there? So I've got just a couple of questions. <laughs> what are y'all cleaning your water lines with? I mean, I could see that being a nightmare. And, and and if it's, you know, I mean, obviously we think about chlorine bleach, right? But I mean, I'm sure you're not using that because of the the effect that would have on on, on your floor and the, and the digestive tract. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of times what it comes down to ahead of time, true cleaning, you know, what we're looking at is cleaning between flocks, um, you know, we're, we're going to try and descale the water lines. And uh, also you may use some bleach products, but usually it's a combination of products to try and get that cleaning process. And even during the flocks, low levels of bleach or iodine are used at times to try and uh, mitigate and lower bacterial numbers. It can uh, take a toll on some of the equipment in the houses, but even in the turkey production side of things, they commonly use uh, chlorine, di chlorine dioxide systems within the houses while the birds are in there. It's a low level of chlorine, so. All right, and so the next thing I, I'd be interested to know is how much kickback did you get from those cooperators when y'all started this deal? Uh, as far as uh, who, who was buying uh, poultry, the meat from us, um, you know, it just really depends if you're early in on it, you know, that you then might've made more sense per pound, what it came down to. Uh, and how a lot of the companies had set it up are cost plus contracts. So where it would be, uh, you know, I'll just this isn't a real scenario, but let's say McDonald's came to uh, visit somebody and they said, we're going to do a cost plus contract. So whatever it was your cost. So if it was 40 cents a pound plus five cents per pound on top of that. So essentially carrying the whole cost of that production plus, um, you know, that added margin. So it's almost like an added margin to what you're selling. 
uh, that's really how they look at the numbers. And that's just, you know, an idea of how that production is. And today with it being, you know, more crowded, you know, I said somewhere around 60 percent, you know, now it's getting more of a commodity so that that margin's not as great. But some of that's just due to pressure, uh, you know, by some of these customers that have made commitments to some, um, you know, animal welfare driven things that have tied no antibiotics ever into it as well. So whether that, you know, seems right or wrong, um, you know, I feel antibiotics still have their place and they, they do their job. And, you know, at times in the past, maybe we use them uh, above and beyond their means. But I think we've come back uh, with judicious use, most definitely across the industry, even those that are still using it today have uh, significantly reduced the numbers and how we're using it just because more vets are now uh, in the production setting than had been in the past that are helping to really make sure we're using it judiciously. So what about deworming the birds too? Because I know that they started using some finbendazole on those birds. They saw an increase in feed efficiency, but they weren't finding worms to start with. Is that, has anybody ever figured out that deal? You know, um, we, we've seen some increase uh, performance as far as feed conversion, and those things. But I think sometimes there is some subclinical worms. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Blaine's on the this meeting call, too, and he did a lot of that research with some of the integrators. And um, as the life cycles went on, originally he saw a higher worm burden, which really helped show that. But even after we got done um, with uh, subsequent cycles of worming, we still saw that same improved performance. And maybe that was uh, whether it had an immu immune modulating effect to the gut uh, itself, um, but realistically just keeping that worm burden low. You know, the old antidote people thought worms didn't really cause you problems, but there is some financial losses even in the poultry sector. Uh, and the turkey side of things, you know, we uh, in feed um, safeguard is used quite routinely in turkeys. Um, for just that reason to try and uh, keep that worm burn down to really help, uh, you know, feed efficiency. So uh, as far as the broiler side of things, we really just have the only on-label product is uh, Safeguard Aquasol available. Um, and it's slowly taken shape. And we kind of look for those things when we're doing bird health surveys to really help our, you know, the producers find those worms and, and really educate them that, you know, they may be giving up something as well as, you know, impacting bird welfare and bird health by having that worm burden there. All right. Any questions for Dr. Chad? All right. We appreciate it, Chad. Thanks so much for doing it. It was All great. Right. No problem, guys. Hope uh, you all had fun learning about some chickens and enjoy the rest of the meeting.